Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Womenetics founder and CEO, Elizabeth Marchand. Today, we are so pleased to welcome Inez Tenenbaum, Chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, a woman whose credentials span more than 30 years of dedicated service. And today, her career culminates in the national and global role she's playing as chair of this commission. Please read about her in the program. But today, I wanted to veer a little bit off script to talk about the real Inez Tenenbaum, who has led a life of what we at Women Ethics call a life of purpose and servant leadership. As we have described our POW winners today, she too exemplifies tenacity and generosity, responsibility and passion. This is a woman who was born in Pine View, Georgia. But the town was so small that she had to go to Hawkinsville, big Hawkinsville High School, to get an education. She grew up in a small town with small time values. I understand that she was a cheerleader and she was a beauty queen. And there's a woman in the audience here today who competed with Inez for the role of beauty queen. Inez won and Karen didn't, and Karen still remembers it. <laughs> She's a graduate of the University of Georgia and received her law degree from the University of South Carolina. As we have talked today about balancing heart and head, in addition to working nonstop in the public eye, she also works with passion when no one is looking. Most people don't even know about many of the things that she really does. From the two Republican senators in South Carolina, Jim DeMint and Lindsey Graham, one of whom she ran against, they endorsed her nomination for this position and spoke on her behalf at her hearing. This is an ability to reach across party lines. From the girlfriends that she has stayed close to for more than 30 years, who meet regularly for what they call the therapeutic dinner, where they have all shared successes and failures, but most of all cherish their friendships with each other when no one is looking. Did you know that Inez currently has a family of six stray animals that she has adopted with pedigree names like Jonah, Rocker, Hutton, David, Eli, Esther, and Miss Ellie. No, she's not on the board of the SPCA, but she does this with heart because she loves animals when no one is looking. From a young African-American man that she befriended when he was in elementary school years ago, who came to one of the first events that she had when she was running for office. And he said this young gentleman, Shakur, in his um, introduction to her, he said, Ms. Tenenbaum, he said, I have researched all the candidates. And he said, I'm gonna endorse you. You are my candidate. She and her husband, Sam, have stayed in touch with this young man for years and years. And today, he is at Winthrop University because of Inez and her husband when no one is looking. And then there's the three single men, women, I'm sorry, from Columbia, South Carolina, who were in crisis with a total combined of 12 children, several of whom had reading disabilities. She found them HUD housing and sent them to school at Sylvan Reading Center to help with their reading disability. All of this when no one was looking this is a true leader, and this is the woman that you are going to hear from today. I'm proud to call her my friend as a native South Carolinian and a part-time neighbor. Welcome, Inez Tenenbaum. Gosh. 
Oh, gosh, thank you, Elizabeth. I don't know when I have ever been introduced in such a very kind way. I really do appreciate that. And now you're all looking, and I am the keynote address, and I'm what's standing between you and getting back to your office. And Elizabeth told me I only had so much time, and if I went over, she was going to stop me. So I will go ahead and give the keynote. It's such a pleasure to be here in Atlanta today to help Women Edics celebrate the Powell Awards. Elizabeth, it seems like yesterday when you and I were sitting in my living room and you were describing the vision of Women Edics, and look at it now. You have built an incredible resource for purposeful women who want to reach their full potential. Women Edics is inspiring. Women Edics is empowering. So I congratulate the women who are recipients of the Powell Awards. Each of these women have been exemplary in your careers and community work, a shining example of lives being well lived. As Winston Churchill once said, you make a living by what we get, but you make a, make a life by what we give. So today I'd like to speak to all of you to encourage you to further your involvement in your community and state and step forward to let your voice be heard in so many important issues as you already are, education, the environment, economic development, and human rights. So whether you speak out as an elected official, a community volunteer, a professional, or a teacher, whatever your position, you can make a difference if you speak truth to power. A few weeks ago in New York City, the third annual Women of the World Conference was held, celebrating the lives of girls and women throughout the world. Women leaders such as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Burmese political leader Aung San Suu Kyi, and actress Meryl Streep, and many other women of valor participated in this conference. Women who, despite extraordinary hardships, have spoken up for peace, health care, human rights, and education. The speeches from the conference are available on the website for women of the world 2012. And I urge all of you to look at this website for courage and inspiration in your own work. At the conference, Secretary Clinton spoke about women all over the world who faced incredible danger. She said, now we know that young, a young woman in Tunisia and her peers across the region already are facing extremists who will try to strip their rights, curb their participation, limit their ability to make choices for themselves. Why extremists always focus on women remains a mystery to me, but they all seem to do it. And it doesn't matter what country they're in or what religion they claim. They want to control women. They want to control how we dress. They want to control how we act. And they even want to control the decisions we make about our own health and our bodies. Yes, it is hard to believe that even here at home, we have to stand up for women's rights and reject efforts to marginalize any of us because America needs to set an example for the entire world. Now, Secretary Clinton explained that in order to accomplish that, we have to, quote, live our own values, and we have to defend our own values. We have to respect each other, empower all our citizens, and find common ground. She wanna, went on to say, we are living in what I call the age of participation. She said, economic, political, and technological changes have empowered people everywhere to shape their own destinies in ways previous generations could never have imagined. All of these women, these women of the world, have proved that committed individuals, often with help, help from their friends, can make a difference in their own lives and beyond. She finished the speech by saying, so let me have the great privilege of ending this conference by challenging each of you. Each one of us needs to be part of the solution. Each of us must truly be a woman of the world. We need to be as fearless as the women whose stories you have applauded, as committed as the dissidents and activists you have heard from, as audacious as those who start movements for peace when all seems lost. Together, I do believe that it is part of the American mission to ensure that people everywhere, men and women alike, finally have the opportunity to live up to their God-given potential. So let's go forth and make it happen. Now, when I was in uh, 
Savannah a few uh, months ago. I went to the port of Savannah to watch how they deal with all the containers coming in of consumer product goods. And a woman there who had a leadership position at the port of Savannah looked at me and she said, you know, I read your resume. You're from Pine View, Georgia. How did you get from Pine View, Georgia to be the chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission? So I wanted to share with you a little bit about, about my background. So it will, uh, if you're sitting on the fence and thinking about taking a risk or waiting for another door to happen, you'll see through uh, my life experiences that do these doors do happen and that if you have a purpose, which you all have, you will continue to see opportunities all along the way. So from 1994 to 2004, I was a candidate in four statewide elections in South Carolina. I ran for Lieutenant Governor, State Superintendent of Education in 1998 and 2002, and the United States Senate in 2004. Now, although I did not win the Democratic primary for Lieutenant Governor in 1994, I did run successfully in 1998 and 2002 for State Superintendent of Education, receiving more votes than anyone on the ballot. And I served as State Superintendent, a job I really, really loved for eight years. Now, I was the Democratic Party's nominee for the United States Senate in 2004, but I lost that race to Jim, Jim DeMint, so my life has not all been about success. There have been, been plenty of disappointments. And then when I was nominated to the chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, as Elizabeth said, Senator Jim DeMint was the first congratulatory phone call I received. And he also provided introductory remarks in front of the Senate Commerce Committee during my confirmation hearing. And he said, please, please confirm Inez, I do not want her to run against me again. <laughs> so your life does come full circle. And those people that you think are, you know, your political enemy turn out to be great friends. So running four statewide offices has given me so much insight, and I want to share these in hopes that if you're thinking about running for office or you're thinking about another uh, a career opportunity or a challenge, that it will encourage you to take that challenge. Now, people frequently ask me, what motivates you to get in public life? I mean, how did you get involved in uh, running for office in the first place, and what's it like to be a woman candidate? Well, my interest in politics began in Pineview, when uh, I began to hear my parents and my grandparents and my relatives all around the dinner table discussing the news of the day, news that would often involve political issues. Uh, every four years, we would watch with great interest the Democratic and the Republican national conventions. Hearing the speeches, seeing the candidates, listening to the commentators, all of it was so exciting and thrilling for me. The nominee for president was not selected in the primary process like we have now. It was selected at the convention. And so we always watch to see who is going to get the nominee, nomination, who is going to get to be vice president. And, um, and it was just drama. If you were sitting in Pineview and could get one television station, it was great drama. <laughs> So as a child, I had an awareness of the importance of electing good leaders, and I began observing the lives of public officials and their families. Also as a child, I wanted to be involved in leadership roles in my school. Uh, the rural school in Pineview, Georgia, where the population was less than 500. My first memory was wanting to be the class fire marshal in the third grade. <laughs> now I lost this election to my cousin, but that did not lessen my desire to be a leader. And when I think about those days in Pineview, if I wrote my autobiograph autobiography, my title would be Everything I Needed to Le Learn in Life, I Learned in Pineview. I remember being in the fourth grade when my teacher, bless her heart, of blessed memory, said in front of the whole class, Inez Moore, you're the bossiest little girl I've ever taught. <laughs> And if you don't change your ways, you will have no friends. I hope she is looking down now because I have lots of friends. Now, my mother was an elementary school teacher for over 20 years, teaching in public schools in Georgia, Tennessee, and California as we moved with my father on Navy tours. She was a natural teacher and a leader, and she was committed to quality, equality, and excellence. She was uh, taught Head Start in the early years of the program. The very first year Head Start was started in Pulaski County. She was one of a few white teachers to go to the then segregated black elementary school to teach Head Start. 
She led by example. And like my mother, my very first career was being an elementary school teacher in Georgia. After teaching four years, I left to become a state employee at the South Carolina Department of Education. I was making $6,000 a year teaching first grade in Augusta, and they offered me $12,000 a year to license Head Starts in South Carolina. So in this position, I licensed Head Starts, federally funded child care centers, and I was the liaison to the South Carolina Department of, uh, I mean, South Carolina General Assembly on, less, on legislation to license child care facilities. Now this was the first time in my life that I had the opportunity to speak out on a social issue. It was empowering. Day after day, I'd go up to the South Carolina General Assembly as the liaison from the State Department of Social Service to advocate for a stronger child care licensing law. It was my first experience working on getting a law passed, and I was 26 years old. The year after the General Assembly passed a child care licensing law, I became the director of research for a big committee called the Medical, Military, Public, and Municipal Affairs Committee. It's called the 3M Committee of the South Carolina House of Representatives. And that was a big jump on a rung from licensing Head Starts to leading a committee in the House of Representatives. But it was in this role that I learned to appreciate and I learned to love governance and the shaping of public policy. I loved the public hearings and listening to people's problems and seeing people introduce legislation. And I was also able to work with a strong woman named Representative Jean Toll, who's part of the Therapeutic Dinner Club, a graduate of Agnes Scott, I might add. And she's now the Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. She was the one who really encouraged me to uh, further my education, and she made me really love the work that we did. Now, the 3M committee responsible for issues relating to medicine and health and human services, aging, child welfare, the environment, adult corrections and juvenile justice, state military affairs, local government, and social services. So after working for the South Carolina House of Representatives for six years, I was accepted into USC's School of Law, as Jean Toll had encouraged me to do. And one of my friends in our therapeutic dinner groups, who was a lawyer, said, you shouldn't do this. You are going to be 35 years old when you get out of law school. I said, well, I'm going to be 35 years old anyway. I may as well have a law degree. <laughs> and I love law school. And I was so glad I waited till my 30s to go because I appreciated the opportunity. Let sit back there and listen. Let someone else do the work. And all I had to do was take the test. It was great. <laughs> now, after the first year of law school, I married my husband, Samuel Tenenbaum, a native Georgian who went to Emory University. We met as volunteers in Jimmy Carter's presidential campaign. My good friend from high school, who's here today, Karen Griffin, she's now Karen Morgan, was married to Jimmy Carter's middle son, Chip. And I was on fire to get our fellow Georgian elected president. And it wasn't beauty queen, Elizabeth, it was homecoming queen of Hawkinsville, <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> Now, Samuel and I were also some of the earliest volunteers when Dick Riley, who became South Carolina's governor, ran for governor. We were part of the 2%. Dick Riley performed our marriage ceremony in the Boylston Gardens at the uh, governor's mansion in June 3rd, 1984. I was Methodist, Samuel was Jewish. You couldn't bring in a, a rabbi or a minister, and Dick Riley, who was governor, said, I'll do it, it'll make both families feel comfortable, and we'll get this done. So it was great. It has been a wonderful 28 years with Samuel. He has been my biggest supporter on the campaign trail and he's been there every step of the way as I lead the Consumer Product Safety Commission. In fact, he gets up with me every Monday morning at four o'clock, gets me to the airport at five for me to catch my six o'clock flight, and he's there on Fridays when I come home for the weekend. And upon graduation from law school, though, I began practicing with the law firm Sinclair & Boyd in the area of health, environmental, and public policy law. And I left Sinclair and Boyd after five years because I never made my billable hour goals. And they were so kind to me, but all I wanted to do was pro bono work. <laughs> so I left and I created a nonprofit organization called the South Carolina Center for Family Policy. And my mission was to reform the state's juvenile justice system. And with the help of then Justice uh, Jean Toll, we did. 
But a few years later, I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. I just got that feeling, uh, I don't know, it came over me. I'd never thought about running for office. But I remember my first interview with the South Carolina editorial board, who will remain, remain nameless, whose endorsement I really, really had to have. At the end of the questions on the issues in South Carolina, the editorial page uh, editor looked at me. He said, Inez, you are very knowledgeable about the issues. You are well qualified to be South Carolina's lieutenant governor. But will South Carolina elect a diminutive woman? I was so taken aback. I said, of course, yes. But in my mind, I thought, well, we sure have elected our share of diminutive men. <laughs> And nobody ever asked them that question. So if you're thinking about running for office, uh, let me share a little bit about the personal introspective, or if you want an appointed office or doing anything that takes you in, in the public eye. The first question you have to ask is, why are you running? It's not a question that, you, uh, that people will ask you. It's one that you ask, have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because running for office is just not a political decision. It one, it's one that goes to the very core of your being. Knowing oneself, one's core values, are essential for an, a successful political career. The unexamined life is not worth living. That's one of my favorite quotations from Socrates and has formed the foundation of my journey into public life. So once you've established your core values and you want to run for the right reasons, the next reason is to examine your life. Because believe you me, your opponents will examine it for you. <laughs> so if you're pondering running for a position, you should ask yourself, is this the right race for me? Other questions you have to ask yourself is, can I manage this race and my family obligations too? Can I run for this office and work full time? Can I afford to run for this office and not work full time? Can I manage my personal and professional life, uh, in, uh, in, and can my personal and professional life be open to scrutiny? Am I physically able to run this race? What do I need to improve my physical stamina? Because you are all over that state all the time. I always tell candidates who come to me who are thinking of running, I said, you must work out every day. It is essential. You cannot drink any alcohol on the campaign trail, and you have to have good nutrition. Stay away from donuts, coffee, sugar. You have to just keep yourself in tip-top shape. The next question, can I raise this money for this race? Do I want to win this race badly enough to overcome all the obstacles and all the hardships? And the bottom line, can I win? In every race that I ran since 1994, I truly believed that I was the best candidate and that I could win. I have never believed that my gender was a handicap. So in an article entitled, Why Don't Women Run for Office, Brown University's Jennifer Lawless and Richard Fox established these findings, said women perform as well as men when they run for office. Studies show a complete absence of gender bias in terms of total votes. Winning elections has nothing to do with the sex of the candidate. So I don't ever think that my not winning in 2004 uh, in the Senate race had anything to do with my gender. In October, both my polls and Senator DeMint's polls showed me in the lead by three points. But in the end, President Bush ended up winning South Carolina by 17 points, making it impossible for a Democrat to swim against a tide, tidal wave of Republican support. But whether you're pursuing an, a public office or a corporate leadership position, it's so important to pursue your passion. And I heard that over and over again from the women who are on our panel. Your reason for living. My passion has always been and continues to be improving the lives of women and children. The best gift for running uh, for the U.S. Senate in 2004 was meeting Barack Obama, who came to South Carolina to campaign for me because then he remembered me and he's given me the privilege of sharing my passion for the well-being of children with the entire country. Had I not won that race, I would have never met him. I mean, I would have met him along the way, but I've never shared that uh, camaraderie of running it for the Senate together. But as chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, I am leading an independent federal agency that protects the public from unreasonable risk of injury and deaths from consumer products. Over the last year, we have especially been focused on children's toys, 
durable nursery products such as cribs and bath seats and baby walkers and strollers, pools and spas, children's apparel and footwear, and recreational off-highway vehicles. Next year, we'll be looking at upholstered furniture, table saws, and a number of other issues that where we see emerging, ha emerging hazards. So I am so proud of the direction and the forward-leaning direction that the CPSC has he uh, is headed under my leadership. Since more stringent rules were established in 2008, recalls of toys and recalls of toys due to violations uh, from lead content have declined 80%. This is progress and is a result of the hard work of the staff by the CPSC. Since the Pool and Spa Safety Act went into effect in December of 2008, no child has died from the horrific hazard of pool drain entrapment. Many of you may have followed in the news about children being pinned to the drain of a pool and being disemboweled and killed because we did not have the proper rules in place for, and laws in place for pool drains. And we are working so hard to maintain a zero death rate and injury rate from this hazard. Now, since the strongest standards in the world for cribs went into effect in June of 2011, the sleep environment for babies and toddlers is safer than ever before. Go into a store that sells baby cribs, and you will see the strongest crib standard in the world. These cribs are better than ever before, and I am so proud of our rules on this. But infant toddlers, uh, infant walkers, toddler beds, and bed rails now have stronger mandatory safety requirements, which is another win for parents, children, and caregivers. Independent third-party uh, testing of children's products is taking place in the United States and all around the world. In, in other words, you can't sell a children's product in the United States or bring it into the country unless you send that toy or children's product to an independent laboratory and have it tested to make it sure it meets all of our world, our rules. And do you know that almost 90% of the toys sold in America are manufactured out of this country? So it's imperative that we have them tested. So independent testing of children's products is one of the most important safeguards sought by parents and consumers, and it was achieved under my leadership. But farther upstream, Chinese companies are starting to incorporate the best practice in manufacturing. And I've seen it firsthand when I met with the Chinese and, and Chinese manufacturers and told them what our standards were. I've seen it in strollers, toys, ATVs, and fireworks made in China, which are a sign of progress. So my philosophy has been take safety to the source, and that philosophy is driving the CPSC's work to work with the Chinese manufacturers to adhere to U.S. standards and build safety into product design. The CPSC's proactive work in the largest U.S. ports is another win for the consumer, and another sign for the CPSC is that we are willing and able to take a stand and protect the consumers of the United States. Because of all these accomplishments, I can confidently say to you that the state of product safety at the CPSC, it is strong and it is built to last. The CPSC is the strongest it has been in decades, and I believe we're making a strong contribution to helping purposeful women keep their families safe. One of the most inspiring parts of my job as chairman is working with other prominent female leaders in government, including Democrats Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Jan Schakowsky, and Republicans Mary Bono Mack and Joanne Emerson, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Susan Collins, and HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, just to name a few. These women display the characteristics of what I believe make a good leader, knowledge, competence, commitment, trustworthiness, resolve, vision, and humility. Many of the women in this room have these leadership characteristics, and those of you who have been recognized to, to receive the, the Powell Award certainly do. The challenge is pro, uh, providing a pathway to leadership positions to so many talented women in this state and country. So the mission of Women Addicts is to encourage young women to value public service, supporting those who are inspiring to lead and are inspired to lead and recognizing good role models in public office. I want to thank Elizabeth and to everyone at Women Addicts for inviting me to speak at this wonderful event and be a part of such a vibrant, uh, meaningful uh, cause and organization here in Atlanta and across this state.
I want to share with you in closing um, one of my poems that inspires me. It's by a poet named Tagore, who was a famous poet in India. And it goes like this. I sleep, slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and I found that life was duty. I acted and behold, duty was joy. From the wonderful stories we heard about the PAL recipients, duty is such a calling. Uh, they have found that no matter what sacrifices, no matter how much effort it takes, that duty is joy in life. And having that purpose in life and living a purposeful life is joy. So thank you for asking me to be with you today, and I will cherish this time in my native state. It's always great to be home. Thank you. <laughs>